Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. We are here with Laura Day, and we're talking about gung -gung, the circle. Oh, woo! And how the power of a single wish can change your life. And we're going to be talking about intuition. What is it? How to use it? Why is it so hard for us to access our intuition? So welcome, Laura. Thank you. This is my first Skype interview. I know. I'm so excited for you. You're a Skype virgin. And how I, I, I'm, I'm honored <laughs> to be your first. I'm loving this. <laughs> okay. So intuition. What is intuition? So intuition is non-local attention. So it's the ability, and, and all of us have experienced it, it's the ability for your attention to move anywhere, even far beyond what you consider its reach. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, you can go online and Google, and there's pub.med. There are 50 years of really amazing research that show that we all have the ability to be precognitive, so to mm -hmm. tell something in the future, that we have the ability to communicate non-verbally and over a distance, mm -hmm. that we have an ability to affect something from a distance. So it's really the ability to take those skills non-locally, your normal senses, right. your normal expression, but to do it non-locally. And of course, for business, people are most interested in precognition, the ability to tell what is coming up, which enables you to prepare better in the present. Right. So how is it different than being psychic or, you know, because people use the word intuitive really broadly. Is it being or uh, the precognition? Sometimes people talk really about divination. Is. Yeah. The difference really is that it is divination, but the difference is that I come from three generations of physicians and scientists mm -hmm. who would die if I used the word psychic. Oh. So back in the early 80s, when, when this was still new, I actually coined the use of intuition instead of psychic. I didn't. I I was really a lab rat. I came to intuition through science, through being tested. So I didn't have that spiritual. Um, well, you're too young to remember this, probably. But in the um, in the late '70s and early '80s, governments were really interested in how the human mind could view remote locations and right. describe what was there. Yes. So. So there were, there, there's actually a lot of research and a lot of programs and a lot of uh, writing about these programs and a lot of documentation. So I didn't come into the intuitive field through mysticism. You know, mm. I was a 21-year-old. You know, my most mystical thing was my body was finally developing. You know? <laughs> I came through. I came to it through science. I, I saw a TV show on re, on the research that was being done because I was a science nerd, and um, and I thought, wow, can everyone do this? I've been doing this my whole life. So I yeah. called them up and I said, I can do what you're talking about. I would never have chosen it as a career. I always wanted to be a writer. Right. But one of the experiments was televised without my permission, um, and and I had this instant following. And because I didn't come to it through mysticism, right. the people I chose to work with were like drug companies, um, textile companies. Uh, I, I worked a lot with Hollywood. You know, I, I chose to work with businesses because the, the feeling at that time, and remember, I'm now, you know, 21, 22, my feeling at that time was that I didn't want to make a mistake with people. You know, no, nothing that a human being does is 100% flawlessly accurate. It just mm -hmm. doesn't exist. And if mm -hmm. anybody tells you they are or they're channeling the word from blah, 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 and it's the app, <laughs> you, you should run, not walk away. I mean, that's right. dangerous stuff. So I felt comfortable working for companies because I was part of a team. I was usually the precognitive part, the future telling part, right. except in medicine where I was often the diagnostic part because, you know, you have to remember in the early 80s, we didn't have the, the, the diagnostic tools we have now. We didn't have MRIs. I don't even think we had sonograms. We didn't have right. any of that. So I was more useful. Now now I'm I'm a little outdated. Well, did they like hide you in a box and sneak you in? Like how did <laughs> like how did it come about that they decided, oh, okay, like we want to actually do some business forecasting, so let's have Laura come in. Would you well, be sitting in front of a boardroom? I'm trying to visualize how this would happen. Well, first of all, business does what works. Mm -hmm. Now at you know, on their annual 
you know, statement to shareholders. They don't have psychic or intuitive, right. you know, consultants. Right. Um, but business does what works. I have never found, and I think once again, it was very helpful to not come in through mysticism mm -hmm. and also to be kind of an uptight, middle-aged Jewish woman, even at the age of 21. You know, right. I was a navy blue, you know, white button shirt kind of gal. Right, you looked so the part. I looked the part. So it it really helped. I, I chose, um, once I had a little power, which was very early on, I chose not to go into boardrooms. I chose to work with one person in a company. That one person would call me with whatever questions. Because one of the things that I think is really important for your listeners is that intuition is an idiot's gift. Three-year-olds have intuition. They don't have intellect. And what we do naturally is repress that intuition so we kind of learn the status quo so we have some reality testing because intuition takes you anywhere. Right. Uh, then as adults, organically, we, we, we open up that intuition usually in two areas, our area of expertise. So my father is still at 87, a practicing doctor, full medical. I love practice. that. He is completely unintuitive about so many things. He is so, when a patient walks into his office, of course, he does all the tests because of malpractice, but he knows what's going on. Yeah, he knows immediately, like, like, oh, you have this particular link thing, but we'll do the test to prove to you that you have this thing. Well, also so I don't get sued, right? Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So in your area of expertise, if, of course, things are going well, you are usually intuitive. That's where you've focused. You've targeted your intuition. Mm -hmm. Also, your area of neurotic preoccupation. So <laughs> if you are, you know, if you are looking for someone like your, you know, abusive parent, your intuition will help you find them. If you are looking for the next illness you can have misdiagnosed by your doctor hypochondriacally, you right. will find it. Right. You know, so, so directing, and we'll speak about this later, directing your intuition, since you cannot turn it off. Right. So directing it is extremely important and also learning the details. So I started working with, um, so how a business would work with me is um, in the beginning, they'd say, well, uh, if we give you a patient, a number representing a patient, can you tell us what's going on? And I'd say, well, I don't know, but I'll try. I mean, right. you know, I was in my yeah. early twenties. I had, I had no horse in the game. I didn't right. need to be a weirdo. I was, right. you know, if right. I, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, or, or a company would say, well, can you tell when, when we'll receive our patent or if someone will beat us to it? And I'd say, I don't know, but I'll tell. Or a clothing company would say, can you tell us, you know, what styles we're, we're going to really cut next. Wow. Yeah. And I, I don't know, but I'll try. And that's really how I train uh, my students. And there is a process that's in the circle and also in, in this book, How to Rule the World from Your Couch. There is a process to do it. I mean, I think people with intuition, you know, my best students, because I do workshops for the public, my best students are not those people who come in believing who are wide open to the experience. My best students are, are traders, are people who are meticulous about their information, meticulous about documenting it, meticulous about putting it together, and disciplined, because everything takes discipline. We discipline our emotions or we'd all be pillaging. Right. You know, we discipline our intellect our entire lives. Um, although with the state of American schools, I guess that's debatable. But, um, you know, everything takes discipline. And with, intu with things like intuition, as with relationships and love, right. people expect it to just appear. Uh, and it I see. So it's, it it's, takes discipline practice. And so that when you're actually meeting with corporate folks, doctors, like as you are refining and practicing and practicing, you're getting better and better at your skill. Yes. And, and, you know, most people who are kind of natural intuitives mm -hmm. are natural intuitives because of early trauma. So they didn't form proper ego structures and or brain injury. So, so, no, I'm serious. So no, because people always say to me, oh, you're very intuitive. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, psychics always say, oh, you're very intuitive. And it's almost a joke to me because I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, nor do I. Like, uh, okay, fine. So maybe I had brain damage. Um. <laughs> you know, for example, you know, a fat child in a famine country, there's no such thing as luck, is not an intellectual. Mm-hmm. 
that's an intuitive. That's someone who has a target, and we'll speak about why that's important later, but who has a target and then has mobile enough attention because of trauma, because they have to, to find what they need. Of course, that mobile attention in childhood is also damaging because your attention goes to to places and things that you should be protected from. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. So really the healthy thing is to have children channel intuition into creativity when they're young mm -hmm. and then to really train intuition as as you enter the workforce because where intuition is most useful is in business and is in the workforce because in relationship the difficulty is there's so much subconscious stuff. There's so much projection. Mm. I stop, if I don't have a text, I live in New York and my son lives in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a text every morning, because of course he gets home when it's 4 a.m. my right. time, so he texts. But if he forgets to text me, my intuition tells me something horrible is wrong. Right. That's my intuition. That's because I'm neurotic and I'm right. a mother. You know? <laughs> so, so in relationship, in interaction, it's actually harder to get accurate data. Intuition is about acquiring data. Mm -hmm. That is all it is. Nothing mystical about it. There are so many programs where they take people off the street and they, they are beyond, way beyond chance in all the categories of intuition, and there are many of them. Um, certainly with training, what you have is you have a reliable asset. Mm -hmm. And for for your work life, that re reliable mobile asset is important because being able to put your attention on your market mm -hmm. and then put your attention on your product mm -hmm. and then put your attention on timing mm -hmm. and then put your attention on manufacturing delivery if it's a physical product or to see, you know, often I see with people with private practices, people don't know how to market themselves mm -hmm. because they market from their perception of themselves, they probably developed in nursery school. Mm -hmm. Instead of marketing from a, an intuitive sense of this is my product and this is the market and this is ethically how I want to present it because mm -hmm. I mean ethics do you know play a role hopefully in people's right. choices. Right. Right. Okay. So let's actually step us through this workbook then. Okay. So, all right. So the first thing you said, and, and I think it, it, it's talked to uh, in, in your chapters intentionality. Right. You're saying focus focus on a particular uh, not, not so much focus as in select and intend so one of the things that happens with focus is people over focus and they narrow their peripheral vision ah. so that's less but but knowing what your target is what is it you want to create Okay, so, you want all right, so I'm going to use my personal example as okay. an example so people. So I, I'll, I'll actually, I was going to use something else, but as you were talking, I realized this is going to Can I chirp in while you're doing it? Yeah, so absolutely. Okay, so, so what I realize is one of the things I'd like to do is help increase consciousness. So my intention is how do I increase consciousness using all of my skills and gifts? Okay, so, um, so as you work the circle more, mm -hmm. Um, your intention is going to get a little bit uh, more succinct okay. because it is you want to use all your gifts. You want to be compensated so you have the time to use all your gifts. Mm -hmm. And how do you know when you've increased consciousness? So one of the rules for intentionality is you need to really have a sense of when the circle has worked, when is it that you have gotten it? What does that look like? And that happens. So it's very important to set a target. With all intuitive work, you need to know the question. Okay. You know, the answer comes in in pieces. You need to know the question. That's your intentionality. So, so I would almost uh, reframe, and I am, I, uh, I am uh, doing, I'm engaged in work that supports my ability to bring the values I care about into the world easily and dynamically, for example. Okay. Okay, and it's it. something that you can experience. Most of us create through our uh. subconscious. So the idea of intentionality and the gift is conscious creation is instead of creating from your subconscious and the subconscious mind makes decisions seven seconds before you're conscious of them. So it's a mm -hmm. very important concept. Instead of creating from your subconscious, which may not be that healthy, you are consciously, it's the beginning of your discipline, you are consciously choosing what you create. 
Okay, so so you changed it from I said I want to create with conscious. I want to actually create increased consciousness. You said, and what I heard you say is, how are you going to measure that? So what can you measure? And so what I heard you convert that to is, I am using my skills to bring forth, you know, stuff that matters. I am fully supported in using my skills. Okay, I'm fully supported in using my skills. And so that actually, I will know whether that's true or not, because I can see whether I'm being fully supported. You look at your email and you look, well, not only that, you know, you do want feedback. So, so later, later in the process, you do get markers, Okay. you know, and, and you'll define what those markers are. How do I know when I'm progressing? And often life offers you uh, signs that you're progressing that you didn't even think about. Okay, got it. All right, so mine is, let's actually just hold, put it as a place. I'm fully um, supported in using my skills. So we converted that into something that was measurable. And then the, the second part is conscious creation. Is that, or is that the second so part? That's the gift. So once, okay. you, once you have a target, mm-hmm. you, what you are creating, you are consciously creating. Okay. And this is not like positive thinking because I'm not a believer in positive thinking. You know, if a bullet's coming at you, it's going to hit you unless you move. Right. Not a believer yeah, in. It's like, I am fully using a pocket. <laughs> you had a baseball. I closed my eyes if the ball was coming at me. Right. Really not, not a good uh, strategy. Okay. Negative thinking is also bad because all you're seeing are the problems. But empowered, realistic thinking is what we're going for in the circle. Okay. And so on the. Uh, the each element has a practice and then something that comes from that practice. So the second element is embodiment. So I'd love for you to speak about your embodiment. Okay. So how do I embody that? How would I embody actually within my body feel when I'm fully supported? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when, when I'm actually fully supported and using my skills, I feel a certain amount of energy. Is that what you mean? So I feel like a certain amount of energy and excitement. Um, and my body feels like, I feel like that kind of the, a trade-off between nervous and excited at the same time. So one of the things that as people really practice the circle, um, because I can tell you're a little new at it. Yeah. One of the things that as people practice the circle is really what embodiment is. It's it's engaging all of your senses, including intellect, Mm -hmm. in experiencing not just the possibilities intuitively, So your embodiment may take you a lot of places in the future, in your past, but experience the possibilities and the obstacles. And what it does is it resets the way you interface with the world, both intuitively and in your daily practice. Okay. So it is literally experiencing your wish come true. Okay. Your target having happened. Now that experience, it, that's not so easy because the first thing that comes up when you practice embodiment are all the obstacles. Mm-hmm. And, and so embodiment is kind of something that you do 20 times a day while you're doing other things. It's also not creative visualization. You are not putting pieces in place. You're allowing. Okay, got it. So what would it look like then? So help me, step me through a way to figure out what embodiment means. I think I understand what it means. So embodiment is you're opening yourself up to the, and, and there, it's much more detailed in the book, but you're opening yourself up to what the experience is of being fully supported in bringing something of value to the world. Okay, um, got it. Okay, you're, got it. You know, you are you know, that integrates all of your gifts. You are, you are allowing that experience. And so your attention will go here, your attention will go there. Something will come up that's, that's a memory, a worry will come up. And, and you, as you do that, what you're doing is uh, many things. A, you're changing your telepathy. So you're changing what you're sending out to the world around you. You are automatically changing your response styles and your behaviors. But you're also kind of doing psychotherapy on mm-hmm. one teeny tiny issue. Instead of saying, let me go through my entire life and see why I, you know, can't make a living, you're, you're saying, let me deal with this one tiny issue, just this one, this one goal. And what happens is um, uh, information comes up in manageable pieces. Now, the gift of embodiment is awareness, and the awareness will help you with the other steps of the circle. It is really the first step to igniting your okay, intuition. Okay, God. So I think this, I think I know my answer now. Tell me whether this is right. I mean, if this is the proper use of what you're talking about with embodiment. So when, when I, when I think, okay, how am I going to, if what does fully supported and using my skill feel, look or whatever, what my sense is about it. I, I think I'm not going to have to do anything. 
the universe is going to send me stuff and then I'll respond to it as it comes. I will. My only job is opening up and allowing and allowing I'll and responding. Roadblock, which we'll get to later. Okay. You'll, right. see as, you'll see as we go on. Um, mm-hmm. So, so um, I mean, my embodiment is actually very similar to yours right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to do an old one. When I embodied, uh, when I embodied bringing a new relationship into my life, mm-hmm. I, I, imb- I just opened myself up to the experience. And the mm-hmm. first thing that came up for me was terror. Ah, uh, okay. I really dealt with the terror. And then I started seeing, then I found a, a, a reading someone had done for me 20 years ago mm. when I was with somebody else who was saying a Colorado cowboy was going to come into my life and I was going to marry him. A, I was never getting married again, which obviously I did. Um, and, and B, a Colorado cowboy. I'm a, I'm a chic New Yorker, not right. happening. Right. I'm married to, literally 20 years later, I'm married to a Colorado cowboy screenwriter, guy's guy, you know. Wow. Alpha, um, but, and, and things from my history came in, the need to, I mean, all kinds of different things came in. The need, um, my, my son and I started detaching. Like, I, the, there were all of these experiences that I responded to. And as I responded to, my life changed. Mm, okay. So, so it's that awareness. And then your next, your, the next thing that happens when you do those two steps are synchronicities. So mm-hmm. what you were talking about before were things you start bumping into what you're trying to create, literally. Right. Yeah. For, for me, actually, I've been just opening up and saying, I don't really want what was clear to me is I don't want to have to work as hard as I've done before. I, I want things to just come like my usually I'm usually a hunter. I like, you know, set a target. I go out and hunt for it. And I spend a lot of time and energy hunting and securing the feast that it will come dragging back into my house. But what I realized that I didn't want to do in this is I, I, what I wanted to do instead was just have stuff brought to me, like someone bringing platters of food into me. That's what I really wanted. And when you embody, you may find that that doesn't work or you may find it does work. And where you'll tell is if things start coming in. And if not, you may have to fuse the hunter and the receiver. Yeah, no, I've uh, things have come in. Things yeah. when I started opening up, things started coming and flooding. Actually, all sorts of job offers, ideas. Please work with me on this, and and that's how you know you are engaging appropriately with the circle. The circle is completely result oriented. It's okay. not kind of how you feel. Right. It's completely, and I have books that are about how you feel. Right. But this, the circle is about, this is my target. I'm going to achieve it. Here is the process. Okay. So, what, so, so as you said, as you just pointed out, and we can skim over this next element, synchronicity. Once right. you do the first two steps, things begin happening that both demonstrate to you what you need to deal with in order to have your target and bring in wonderful opportunities you just start literally bumping into them right that sounds wonderful but sometimes it's overwhelming yeah no it's it's a mix it's a mix I thought oh I want I don't want to navigate anymore but when you actually aren't hunting anymore uh certain prey like you know someone brings in and it's like oh here's like a a platter of carrots like that's not what I wanted (laughs) or you know or or like all these you know platters that the foods that are being brought in some of them like I don't know I'm not sure, you know, so it actually opens up that level. That's what's happened to me. The synchronicity yeah, has I, happened. Absolutely. And the, the gift of synchronicity is you are working with your world. So you are effective. You're right. not working. Uh, you're not working against what you want. Um, and, oh, you know, no, I'm doing that, too. Well, yeah. You know what? None of us. I, I always say to my students, anyone who tells you they're fully ascended, you're talking to a dead person. <laughs> <laughs> because, because we are here on earth to work through all this stuff, okay. which is what my next book is about. Okay, so, so, the, so effectiveness so, is the next sta- stage after synchronicity. And the next stage, this is my least favorite one. I'm someone, I have my seventh grade gym suit, making space. So in order to create something new, you really do have to make space. You need to let go of old ideas, old behaviors, old things, sometimes the town you're in, mm-hmm. sometimes the way that you feel protected when you interface, you have to make space. Having done the first three steps, 
as long as you continue to do the circle, you'll be hit with the things that you need to let go of. Right. And most of us, I had there's I saw this in, on Facebook where I get most of my news, and I thought this is me. It said everything I ever let go of has claw marks in it. Mm, yeah. It, it is very hard to make to make change. I remember when the love of my life, my husband, asked for a drawer. I almost had a nervous breakdown. A <laughs> drawer. <laughs> you know, it is very, very hard because our lives are always full. But the gift of making space is the transformation. And that, is, that I find, is often one of the most difficult elements of the circle mm -hmm. is because we, you know, we love and honor what we have, even if it's miserable and horrible and ponderous. And, you know, there are reasons we put it in place. Mm. Um, so that's a very challenging element and of course the book itself takes you really through yeah. it and the idea of doing the circle is that you do it over and over again right I mean, so when I, I when I tuned into this and so making space look to me like what I've noticed is as I've actually been opening up to the circle or this intention and seeing the synchronicities what's happened for me is I think oh gosh, you know, now that I'm doing this, what effect will I have on my family? Will I be able to be there for my son? And so even though family has been a beautiful um, support, it also is something that I'm attached to. So that was what came up for me when I, made, when, when I was opening up and making this stuff happen or things were coming to me. What then came up as a potential objection, you said you heard some other one, but what came up as an objection was, is that what making space, like what's opened up is, wow, I have to decide what I would like to do with my family. Can I explore, fully support using my gifts, you know, my work gifts, and still keep my family intact? So that's what happened. And making space will be a lot of things. I mean, often when, when I'm in the making space part of the circle, I compulsively go through my sock drawer or my closet or... I decide to react differently or that it's not so important to have pride in a certain area. Or I, I like recently I have distanced from some relationships. I, you know, oh, just, so it's literally creating space. It so is like literally create this. Book oh, I see. Okay. So yeah. literal. There is nothing ethereal about it. And the gift, the, you know, the, the gift of making space is the transformation because there is never space. We are always complete. So when you make space, something comes in to fill it. And, and what happens as you work through, you know, you brought up a, a perfect making space issue. So making space, you may have to let go of some of your family's dependence. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, that terrifies me because I'm a control freak. Right. But you may have to let go of some of that. That might be some space. You know, there's so many different possibilities. But as you work through that, it organically takes you to the next element. Uh, I see. So making space then creates the gift of transformation. Uh, right. Okay, I get it. Okay, I get it. This is really helping to kind of like take your book, what I read, and I'm like, I didn't really understand it, but I get it now. Okay. Well, also the circle. I mean, I literally still read the book and do like, this is my workbook. I literally, I did it quickly because I don't want anyone to read it. Look, right. I, I literally wrote in my workbook, but I literally do my own workbook every day. And it's something that I'm still... I'm still basically learning this technique. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning more refined ways to apply it. But when these issues come up, it takes you to the next element. And of course, you don't have to do these elements in order. Right. It, what's real, it's fun sometimes. That's why it's a circle. You know, it's fun sometimes to enter here or there. Uh. But coherence is, is the next element. And mm -hmm. coherence is where you say, okay, I'm making a pie chart here. These are all the things I value. Um, like, I really value flexibility in my life. I value that above anything else, flexibility in my life. So, so flexibility. I want uh, my family to be close and loving. I want to have enough money to continue to live in New York City well. Um, I, you know, so you take, and I'm not talking about throwing in the kitchen sink. Right. You pick four or five things. And you find way, and you put your your target in the center, and you you use intuition, intellect, emotion, your friends, your therapy. You use everything to resolve the rub, to resolve the conflict. Most of the reason that mm. we don't get our goals quickly is that any two concerns have conflict. Mm -hmm. Any two. 
and they may seem like 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 they don't you know um i want to i want to have a happy family and i want to have a wonderful dinner tonight even has conflict because right. someone in the family isn't going to want to talk right you know right. everything has rub and the more you take out the rub the more elegantly you move forward so that's a very important part and one of the things i tell people with intuition is don't throw out logic don't throw out experience don't throw out your education don't throw out good counsel intuition is a very powerful piece of it anyone successful is intuitive because it gives you information for you that everyone doesn't have right targeted for you okay so coherence but, i just want to make sure i even get the whole idea so this is you say list the different conflicted areas of your life which you you so is the coherence as you said, so for mine, I think I want I want work to be fun, engaging, beautiful, and creative. That's those are the things. Those are the criteria that I would that's need. That's only that's only your target. Okay. So coherence is where you take all the pieces of your life. You know, you often see. Um, I, I've often worked with traders who've like had a great run and then they crash. Mm -hmm. They didn't lose their skill. They didn't lose their intuition about the market. They didn't lose their education usually something else is going wrong in their life. Usually uh, two months before, you know, a, a relationship had difficulty or they had a health crisis. Or, so you, you, what coherence is, is this is my life's pie chart. Right. Okay. So, got it. So it's like financial, spiritual, whatever. Does it all, does this now make sense given the, my whole life? I get it. Okay. Got well, it. Not, not, not does it make sense, but how do I make sense of it? Because once you commit to a goal, you stick with that goal. Okay, you know, bad people bad. like to waffle. And, and the gift of coherence is you're not working against yourself most okay. of the time. Right. And so all of your actions, instead of taking you know, two steps forward, one step back, all of your actions or most of your actions are actually bringing you to your goal because they're not in conflict with your other goals. Uh, okay, get it. So I, I think I get it now. So when I'm going into the circle, I'm, I'm going into this coherence circle and saying, okay, I'm intuitively opening up. I know what's in the circle. It's my family. It's work. It's spirituality. It's community. Whatever makes up my circle. Money. Whatever is in my circle. So I'm tuning in. And thinking about my intention, like what what, what oh, do I do? Tuning in, it's really a more complex process, and it's it's. I think it's a little easier to to go over it more broadly because it's really okay. it is in the book. Um, it's not it's not tuning in. It's it's you have your target. You're using your intuition. You you use your intellect. You you really negotiate between these parts of your life. It's not something you do in five minutes. It's something you do often over the course of months. Ah, I mean, I've okay. Targets that have taken me a year to achieve, and targets that I've achieved in a week miraculously. And it really is on some level, not just the work you're willing to put into it, how much you're willing to devote yourself to the process, but it's also, you know, your ability to make certain shifts. And that changing is very hard and you don't want to traumatize yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had gotten my love when my child was still, hadn't gone to college yet, there would have been a whole other host of problems I wasn't prepared to deal with. Mm -hmm. There wasn't coherence for me in that. Mm. So, so, and what coherence does take us to is the next element, which is outer roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And outer roadblocks are, is the, the realism of saying, okay, there are a lot of people in the consciousness taking yours. There are a lot of people in the consciousness market. Um, so one of my outer roadblocks might be uh, that, that, uh, I need to, I'm having, I need to make something unique enough that it, it goes to the front of the market. One of my outer roadblocks might like for myself, my outer roadblock is I can barely use a computer. Right. So I, mean, I still write my books longhand. Right. So, so an outer roadblock, maybe, gee, social media exists. I need to either hire somebody. Uh, so these like are literal tactical things that are okay. going to cause problems if you, like, when I actually go into this area, here are some like, t right, tactical exactly. things that are problematic. Okay, and got what's it. really interesting when you work on outer roadblocks is here's where intuition kicks in. You'll get a sudden sense that there is going to be something and you're feeling March in your area that would be really helpful. You don't know of anything. So you start looking, what's going on in my area in March? 
and you see a conference. Mm. And, and so, so that's where intuition, where precognition, really an outer roadblock can say, oh, here's a problem I didn't even see coming up that I can address now in the present so I don't, so I'm prepared for it. And here's an opportunity coming up. Mm-hmm. And, and most of us don't see outer roadblocks because we have been taught to be so disempowered. Mm. You know, we've been taught, if someone had told me that I'd be making a living being weird <laughs> in you know, 1982, right. I said, yeah, you're crazy. You know, I mean, I make a living being weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, you, right. and a roadblock is saying, okay, how do I intuitively, what do I need to address now to not have problems in the future? Okay. But is, so just to be clear, so let's say that this is something that I'm working on for the next two or three months or two or three weeks or two or three minutes. I, I, I'm sure that's a ridiculous one, but let's say I'm working on this for the next two or three months. It's just, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm know that this is what I, is this my attention is focused on outer roadblocks and is that how I'm opening up to something? You use the word focus and it's not, it's not focus because when, when I think of focus, intuition is about really seeing the 360 okay. and also being able to move it forward in time and space. Okay. Focus is about narrowing. So outer, what happens in the circle is as you do the elements things come to you. So you will become aware back in your embodiment, which you'll be doing every day. You'll become aware of, Oh my goodness, I can't do this. The market's flooded. What am I going to do? You know, you'll, you'll get, Oh my God. Uh, Okay. So, so when you do, when you're going through the process, as you're opening up, stuff will come. What do you do with these outer roadblocks when they come? Okay. Got it. And, and sometimes intuition will address them. Sometimes logic, sometimes you'll need to get help I see. you know um sometimes uh so so i'm um i'm doing usually i multitask mm-hmm. um and i'm not good at it i'm doing a lot of projects at once right i right. realized that i had that i really had a roadblock and the roadblock was that the following year i wouldn't have time to promote all these projects i'm doing right right so i had to choose And so I looked ahead and I looked at what was happening in the world next year and I made appropriate choices. So, and the great thing about the the circle workbook is when you write these things down, you will see how accurately you have predicted the future. Right, because you've written it down. Because you've written it down. That my sister has instructions, should anything happen to me, the first thing she does is burn every one of my circle workbooks. So the gift of outer roadblocks, you know, when you cover your eyes, when you when you block out an awareness because you feel disempowered or because you don't want to see something, you don't want to deal with something, you can't you you can't see anything. So the gift of really aggressively like a hunter dealing with outer roadblocks is intuition because mm-hmm. you will repress what is too uncomfortable for you to see. Mm. And I use see. Some people feel, some people hear, some people just know. You know, intuition uses all of our senses. Mm. If you are repressing that, you're going to be repressing the good information too. Mm-hmm. And now, is that what inner roadblocks is? No, inner roadblocks is, so the next element, when you deal with outer roadblocks, one of the reasons the outer roadblocks exist is because in your development, you haven't always been clear about what you are going after. You have old wishes that you're still unconsciously working on. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're, there's an, there is a, an inner um, matrix. There's an inner framework that, that when you're addressing these outer roadblocks that only really exist because you haven't dealt with them prior, mm-hmm. when you're addressing them, your resistance to addressing them or your hidden agendas are going to come up. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, inner roadblocks is the most um, valuable part of the circle. And that's just for me personally, mm-hmm. because the changes I make in, you know, being, you know, being less of a perfectionist in order to be able to, uh, do larger groups. Mm-hmm. Um, the the you know the inner roadblocks that I that I address are things that last me a lifetime. Mm. Right, they have a lasting change. So enjoy 
your life no matter what's going on. Right, I see. An, an amazing gift. And so it is really the gift of inner roadblocks, dealing with these inner roadblocks, is healing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, um, and, and careers have inner roadblocks. So my first challenge in my career, my first inner roadblock, was I had no desire to be spiritual, what spiritual meant in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't going to eat on a diet for a small planet that made me gassy. Right. You know, I, I wanted to wear nice clothes. I was 21 years old. Right. You know, I, I am a very direct speaker. I didn't want to incorporate language that I thought had no meaning and I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to continue to wear navy blue. I'm very conservative, <laughs> not politically, though, right. though Democrat. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I, so, so I had to make certain changes. And so at first I was militant and I alienated a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, oh, please, you know, I, I, I eat meat and I'm so blah, blah, blah. Right. I alienated a lot of people because I was so militantly from my childhood of, you know, of feeling like, okay, it's a rational world and this has to be rational to be valuable. Right. But slowly I dealt with my inner roadblocks and I learned Things like I, I was a meditation resistor until a year ago. I'm 57 years old. Yeah. Wow, meditation rocks. Yeah. But that's an inner roadblock. Uh. That, and you work through it. And what and that is just that creates healing on every single level. Right. So emotionally, financially, physically, spiritually, although though that word makes me crazy. Um, you know, it it just inter, interpersonally. That dealing with those inner roadblocks touch every area of your uh, life. I see. Okay, got it. So this is almost like it's, it's, it's a navigating your whole path, your spiritual path in, in some ways. Because I look at Okay, you can do whatever you want, but that's the word I like. But it's not, it's not just your spiritual path. Because uh, my next book is about the idea that a spiritual being in a material world, mm -hmm. you know you're doing well when your material reality is going well. Now, for some people, that doesn't mean being rich or that doesn't mean being gorgeous or it doesn't mean being a superstar. For some people, that means living simply off the land. Right. For some people, it means you know doing pro bono work. You know, it means different things to different people. But I think I, my aversion to the word spiritual mm -hmm. is that Suffering is not spiritual. Suffering, for example, means you're doing something wrong that you need to heal. Right. Um, right. You know, not having enough. Poverty is not spiritual. Paying someone not a living wage is not spiritual. Like, the, the reality is actually, I think, that a good reality is a, the most spiritual act in the world. So when you look at your life, you know where you're having a spiritual crisis by where you're having a material crisis. Okay, got it. All right, I won't use that word ever again. No, no, no you can't. <laughs> okay, how about, how about the element of contact? <laughs> totally teasing you. You know, so, I mean, I think you have put together a really dynamic forum for people, mm -hmm. and you reach a lot of people. That, for me, is a sign of your spiritual evolution, certainly in that area of your life, is mm -hmm. that you are effective. Mm -hmm. We need to be effective first for ourselves, mm -hmm. then for our families, then for our communities, then for our world. Mm -hmm. You know, that is what being in a body is. We have plenty of time to be, you know. But that, you know, that effectiveness, I think it shows spirituality. A healthy body shows that you are spiritually whole in that area Mm -hmm. of your life. Illness doesn't mean you're not spiritually whole. It means that you have injuries that you're still working through mm -hmm. probably from your past that need to be repatterned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, so when, you, when you work through that element, so when you work through those inner roadblocks, the last element of the circle is contact. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you have your goal. You've taken it through a process mm -hmm. over and over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. And you will see that your first awarenesses pale as you go on because they become so detailed and rich. But contact is, that is where your material reality, your physicality, your humanity and humanness does come together with the energy of oneness, which is what I call spirit. Okay. Um, 
and and that you know the that we are all just little pieces of the same field mm -hmm. now has been shown in physics and mathematics and astronomy and biology it is real it's science now mm -hmm. we are part of one field and and so with with the circle and with intuition the idea is how do I use the fact that I'm part of a field to create in the world? Uh, okay, got it. Okay, so that's what the contact is. If I were one with the world, then what would it, how would I create from that place? Is that what well, you mean? No, it's here's my goal. Mm -hmm. And my goal is part of me as, as a one particle in this oneness. Mm -hmm. But now how do I interface with the oneness as an individual? Uh, how do I interface in a way that creates okay, what got it. in the world? Okay. You've already healed and transformed and connected and done all those things in the other elements. And the gift of contact is unity. It is being mm. able to transcend self while still having self. Mm -hmm. And that is my, my description of perfect humanity that you have an intact ego, that you are creating in the world, that you are an individual, and yet you're also able to use that oneness to easily create in the world while at the same time you're processed by what you create and who you are is creating for others. Right, got it. Yeah, so then if I, so this is a workbook that you use. So that way you stepped us through the whole workbook basically and kind of just going over the major concepts. This is something you do every day. And so do you, that's what you said, you do it every day yes. and you write in the notebook. And I know in the back you, of this book, you have a whole bunch of exercises to do. So, and so then as you're kind of traveling the circle and going to different parts of the radius of the circle, you're kind of seeing your, what, what changes. Like you'll have one awareness and another awareness and you can see the evolution of this because you have it all recorded in one place. And then, yes, and also then sometimes the last element, sometimes contact will throw you right back to embodiment because you'll mm. totally lose, you'll totally lose your, your goal in just the experience and all of a sudden things will begin to become diffuse and not as powerful and you'll have to go back. You know, you, each element needs to be worked over and over. And even for me, and I've really been, been doing the circle since I was very young. I mean, the mm -hmm. circle just kind of came to me and it was my survival skill. Even for me, I, I, I have to keep doing it and it opens me up more and more because of course, the moment that you have worked through those inner roadblocks, you've achieved that goal, you've dealt courageously with the outer roadblocks, you've made contact, there's a whole other batch of stuff you need to work <laughs> That's what being human is. Absolutely. I love, I love how... You took your scientific um, predisposition and you created a structure that maps to your life and how you've navigated life and then shared it. Because that's essentially what it is, right? You have a very kind of analytical structured mind and you put together, you articulated it and then put together a process that all of us can learn from. Very beautiful. So we have Laura Day. Um, we've been talking about her book, The Circle.